to turn to Ephesians 2 as we continue in this book. And what I want to do this morning is, you know that every time I bring us to a text, I always give us a lead in. I give us a thought to think about as we come into the text. I want you to think about this thought as we move into the text this morning. I want you to, first of all, think about the uh, title of the message this morning called From Foreigners to Full Citizens. I want you to just grasp that thought with me as we move through the text. From foreigners to full citizens. And I want us to think about the idea of at one time being excluded from some community. But through some extraordinary circumstances being included in that community. And the two, the two illustrations that come to mind this morning for me in our own midst is Mukutu and his family. If you've ever had an opportunity to talk to Mu about where they came from and where they are now, you would understand this illustration. They were living in Myanmar, uh, formerly known as Burma, and they were living as, in, in migratory camps because of persecution. And they were all over the place, and they're always constantly fearing for their lives and one day, God miraculously opened the door for them to get papers to come to America. Just incredible. You need to talk to him about it. And, and, and how God has opened the door for him to become a full citizen of the United States. What an incredible story. That reminds me of what we're going to talk about this morning. And the other one that's not quite as personal as intimate is the idea of being part of a country club that you were excluded from. Let's be honest. Country clubs are very exclusive. Country clubs, you either have to have wealth or status or usually both to get in. And you imagine wanting to be part of a country club because, Pat, you know there's good golfing at this country club, right? And you just know there's no way you're ever going to be a part of that because you can't afford it. And somebody comes along and says, hey, Pat, I want to pay your dues so you can be part of this country club, right? So those are just a couple of illustrations to think about the idea of going from foreigners to full citizens. Because that's exactly what's happening here in the text this morning with the Gentiles in relation to Israel. So let's go there. Let me, let me hit us with three thoughts this morning. Uh, and, and basically, as I put this text together, God gave me three points, but he gave me three questions that I want us to ask of the text in verses 11 through 22, okay? The first one is, what is true of the Gentiles before Christ? Now, let me just explain something to you. You say, well, what's different from what he's talking about in 11 through 22 from verses 1 through 10? In 1 through 10, he was talking to them about individual salvation as Gentiles. Now he's going to get corporate on them. He's going to talk to them as a whole group. And by the way, a, a Gentile... Uh, was somebody who was part of the nations, part of somebody who wasn't part of Israel. So anybody in the world apart from Israel was considered the nations. They were considered the Gentiles or the Greeks. And you're going to hear some things about them today and about us. Because they're saying, let me ask you this question right up front. How many of us, as believers in Jesus, were Jewish before we got saved in here? I'm looking around, looking around, looking around. Zero. So this will relate to us because we were all Gentiles at one point, okay? So I want us to ask, what is true of the Gentiles before Christ? And what I want you to see in verses 11 and 12 is the idea of exclusion and alienation as a whole, okay? So listen to what Paul says. He says, remember that. Remember that. So recall to mind, don't forget, remember that at one point formerly, you, the Gentiles in the flesh, when he's talking about Gentiles in the flesh, he's not talking about something spiritual here. He's talking about literally the fact that you were born Gentiles, you, that your, your, your heritage is to be born Gentiles. You who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. And he goes and he says it again. Remember that at that time when you were in the flesh, okay? You were, and, and there's five things I want to point to. You were separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Now, he, I'm just going to say this up front. In the same way that Paul 
paints a very bleak picture of Gentiles in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 in terms of salvation. Paul's going to paint a bleak picture of them as a nation up front. And, and I was talking to somebody yesterday who I'm helping to prepare for her own Bible study going through Ephesians. And I asked, I said, why do you think God paints such a bleak picture up front? And her response was, I think God wants them to remember where they came from. He wants them to remember and, and how without Christ, they would still be in that state, okay? So let's go back and look at what's true of the Gentiles before Christ. They were excluded and alienated from these things. Let's look. So it says, formerly you were separate, okay? You were, and you were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, okay? Not only were they, were they not part of God or not part of Israel, but they were looked down upon by Israel. And, 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 and one of the things that really struck me as I was putting this message together, if we read this set of verses through the eyes and the lenses of a 20th century Gentile Christian, we're going to miss the point. We're going to miss it completely. But if you read it through the eyes of an early Christian, and for those who are studying with me on Thursday night, the book of Acts, you understand what Paul's going to be saying here, there was some serious rift between the Jews and the Gentiles back then. If you read it through those eyes, you'll understand more and have a deeper appreciation of what Paul's saying. He says, basically, not only were you, he's going to go on to tell them you were separate from Israel, but they let you know that you were separate from them. Right? And what's interesting is uh, the, so the uncircumcision was a derogatory term. Right? You're uncircumcised. It was completely derogatory and it was a term of scorn toward the people that they were separate from and from the people they considered their enemies. Well, that was not God's original plan. That was God's not, not, not God's intention. Because if, and here I'll give you some cross references. You can go look them up. Right? Isaiah 42 6 talks about the fact that they were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. They were supposed to be the ones that were supposed to point to the God that the Gentiles didn't know. Well, they didn't do a very good job. As a matter of fact, not only did they not point the Gentiles to the God that they were supposed to know, but they act, actually acted worse than the pagans that were supposed to be pointing this holy God to. They were awful. Israel was horrible, right? Deuteronomy 7 2 through 6, they were basically told as they were getting ready to go in the land by God himself through the prophet Moses that they were to be separate from them. They were to get rid of their enemies. They weren't supposed to be anywhere near their enemies because of the negative influence that they would have on God's holy people, right? But they took it too far. They took it too far. The very nation that they were supposed to be the light to, they ended up scorning, right? And Romans 2, if you want to go back and read Romans 2, talks about their attitude toward the Gentiles and how God is going to judge them for doing the very same things they were looking down on the Gentiles for. So he's reminding them, this is what you were before Christ, right? You were looked down upon, you were scorned. Then he goes on to say five things to them. Remember, at that time, apart from Christ, you were separate from him. Means, and by the way, the word Christ here, you've got to understand something interesting. You've got to read this through the eyes of a Jew, not a Gentile. Not a Jewish, not a Gentile believer in the 20th century. You've got to read it through the idea of not Jesus as Savior, but Jesus as covenant Messiah to Israel. Okay? He was their promised covenant Messiah, and what's interesting is Jesus himself even said when he came on the scene, I didn't come for the Gentiles. My purpose was not to come to be the Messiah for the Gentiles. My purpose was to come to the lost sheep of Israel. He first and foremost came to Israel. So, so even Jesus in his own actions, in his own words, was saying to them, no, I'm not here for you primarily. You're not the reason I'm here. So the Jews have every reason to believe that there's something special but they took it over the top, right? And so he says, you're separate from Christ, which means you have no covenant connection to him like the Jews did as Messiah. 
You have no covenant connection at all to the Messiah. Okay? Then it gets worse. You're excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. It literally means, to, the word uh, excluded means to be estranged or alienated. Has anybody in here ever been alienated from a group? You ever been in a time where you've been alienated from your family? Right? Alienated from a group that maybe you were once part of? You know what that feeling feels like, right? To be estranged, to be alienated. It's not a very nice feeling. It's not a fun feeling to be on the outside looking in, which is what the Gentiles were. They were on the outside looking in to Israel. And Israel was supposed to be that glimpse of God. And they were on the outside looking in. So they were estranged. The word commonwealth here really carries with it the idea of a community or a citizenship, right? And he says you were excluded, you were alienated from this theocracy, this group of people that God had called out through Abram, part of this community, this group, or this group under which God made himself known and became in a relationship with them. So you were excluded from all that. You didn't have any of that at all. Then he goes on to say, to make it worse, you were strangers to the covenants of promise. And this is interesting. Um, this is why you keep studying the scripture. This is why you don't just study it once and I, I got the answers. Because as I studied it more, I realized that the last time I taught through this, I was missing something, right? Um, are you grateful that your pastor studies Scripture? Aren't you grateful I'm not one of those guys that gets up here and, you know, looks at the Scripture for five minutes, reads the Scripture, and starts giving a psychology lesson? I mean, there's enough of that going on today, right? But as I studied it deeper, I discovered that I had missed something in the Scripture that God wanted to reveal to me. Listen to what he says. And you are strangers to the covenants of promise. But in the Greek, it actually reads this. It's actually kind of mistranslated here. In the Greek, it really reads, and you are strangers to the covenants of the promise. The promise. That makes a huge difference because anytime you add the word the to something, it's a definite article in English and it's speaking of something very specific. So he's not talking here about the other covenants that God had made with Israel, like the Mosaic Law and the, the, Abraham, or the, the Davidic Covenant. It's not talking about those covenants. It's talking about the covenant specifically that he made with Abraham through which salvation would come and salvation would come through Messiah. He said, you are excluded from that. So I don't know if you're catching the picture already. What was their hope of salvation? as Gentiles virtually zero at this point okay then he goes on to say right you have no hope and what, what does he mean by that well as I read the commentators they said it could mean two things it could mean that you had no hope of the Messiah or no hope of enter into a relationship with God no salvation but it also could mean that utterly you had no hope at all because think about it Listen to what he says next. And not only that, you're without God in the world. Right? You have no connection whatsoever to God, whatsoever to salvation. You don't have God at all. And what's interesting, what he means here when he's talking about without God in the world, he's, he means this. You are without the knowledge of the one true and living God, thus destitute of any God at all. And what's interesting, if you look at Galatians 6.8, I won't take you to many cross-references, but, uh, but if you go to actually Galatians 4.8, listen to what Paul says in Galatians 4.8, which makes sense in the context of this. He says, however, at that time, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which were by nature no gods. What he's saying is, the pagans had their gods, but they really weren't God. So you had no God at all, even though you had a pretend God, you had a God that you were worshiping, it really wasn't a God at all, because if you look at what, ba what the, the Bible says about idols, they're nothing but wood and stone, they have no breath, nothing. They can't do anything for you. So these pagans were worshiping these false gods who could do absolutely nothing for them. And so what he says is you're without God. You don't know the one and true living God. And even the, the gods you're serving aren't gods. You have 
So think about what bleak picture he's just painted for them. You're excluded, alienated completely. And you say, well, big deal. So what? So what? They didn't have God. Because they didn't have God, they didn't have salvation. They didn't have hope after this life was over. You know, or, or they had whatever hope they had was in something that's false. Have, by the way, have you ever met people who've put their hope in everything but Jesus Christ, thinking they're getting to heaven? <laughs> you just want to shake your head and go, okay, that's what you think. But hope in the scripture is defined not as, I hope I have something. I hope I got it right. Hope in scripture, true hope is talk to, talking about hope where you can expect something and fully know that you're going to get it at one point. And so what he's talking about here is the only hope they had was in the one true God who could give them salvation through Messiah and give them eternal life. And not only hope later, but hope now. Something to live for now. They had none of that. None whatsoever. So he paints a, a really, really, really bleak picture. I believe... Because he wants them to understand what they now have. And, and I want you to understand something else. This is a question that was raised yesterday by somebody as we were walking through the text. They said, well, does that mean that before Christ, these Gentiles were completely lost? Yes and no. As a nation, they were. But if you look back in the Old Testament, and you look back even in Acts, or even in the Gospels, there were God-fearing people. There were God-fearing Gentiles. So the ones that chose to try to find this God on their own, God welcomed them in. There are going to be, trust me, non-Jews in heaven who trusted in God, who trusted and looked forward to the Messiah, who were actually part of the community individually, but as a whole, they had no hope. Individually they did, but as a whole they had no hope. But this is where it gets good, right? You go from that bleak and you go, but look at what he says next. But now in Christ Jesus. But now, and this is your new reality, and, and it answers the question, what's true of the Gentiles in Christ? This is what's true outside of Christ. What's true in Christ? And the point that I want to make is the entrance or accessibility for the Gentiles in verses 13 through 18. He says, in Christ, you who formerly were far off. Do you understand what he means when he says you who were formerly far off? Far off from God, from any connection to God, any hope of eternal life, any connection to salvation. You are so far off, right? He says, have now been brought near how? By the blood of Christ. By Jesus dying for your sins. Now, what's interesting, church, you got to understand something. This is where you got to study. Because you, you can say, well, is God's plan for the Gentiles just because the Jews rejected? What if the Jews hadn't rejected? Right? And if you understand Scripture, you look back, it's always been God's plan to include the Gentiles in salvation. Because of the promise made to Abraham, right? And through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So it's all, but in terms of God's unfolding the plan, it comes very late in the process. So it doesn't look like they have any inclusion. And by the way, what does that mean for us as Gentiles? Do you realize that apart from Christ... You and I are exactly in verses 11 and 12. You get that, right? We would have no hope at all. But because God does have us as part of his plan, and at one particular moment in time through the apostle Paul, who becomes the preacher to the Gentiles, we now begin to understand that we are meant to be part of that. But now he says, in Christ Jesus, you are for, you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. And he says, for he himself is our peace. He's our peace. This is interesting. You know, uh, who is Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? What's interesting is if you look at the phrase in verse 13, right? In Christ Jesus. I've always wondered why 
the Apostle Paul talks about Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. What's the purpose of it? And I had my eyes open as I was studying this week. Christ is the term Messiah in, 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 uh, in Judaism. It's, it's the Messiah. It's the Greek Christ is the anointed one. It's the translation of uh, Hebrew. But it's, it's the, the title of Messiah. Jesus points to the specific one who would come as Messiah. So it's not just a random name, Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. It's the idea that he is the Messiah that was spoken of in the Old Testament, promised in the Old Testament. Jesus, his name, which means God saves, is the specific one who was going to be the Messiah. Man, when I saw that this week, it was like, that's pretty cool. I've never seen that before in Scripture. So it says, he alone, he himself is our peace. Well, whose peace is he talking about? If you look in the context, he's going to talk about the peace of both the Jews and the Gentiles. So the one that was far off is now going to be the one that is going to be peace between the Jews and the Gentiles. He is our peace. And what's interesting is the phrase he himself is interesting. It can mean two things. It can carry the idea of he alone, there's no other. Jesus himself is the only one who can bring peace. Nobody else can bring peace but Jesus. That's pretty, pretty cool in itself. But it also carries with the idea he, did it, he, he didn't just give peace, he was peace. He was peace in his own person, in Jesus' body, on the cross. He was the offering of peace for us. So he, and I don't know if you can understand the, the depth of that. It's not just God said, okay, I'm going to give you peace. Jesus said, I'm going to make sure that you have the peace because I am the peace. And what do you see in Isaiah? Back in Isaiah, in the Christmas story, he is called the what? Prince of Peace. He would be the one who would bring peace. And we're going to see in a minute, not just between the Jews and the Gentiles, but he's also going to make peace between us and God vertically, right? And the word peace here is interesting. He's the one that is our peace. The word peace means to join together that which was separate. That which was separate is now going to be joined together. And you're going to say, well, what was joined together that was separated? Well, let's keep going. Listen to what it says. He says, he is our peace. By the way, cross-reference, if you want to go look it up, Romans 5.1 talks about Christ being our peace. He says, who made both groups into one. Two groups, Jews, Gentiles. He's going to make them into one group now. All right? Those who were completely separated by what? Listen to what it says. And he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, the, the, the hostility is another way of saying it, which, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinance so that he might himself make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Okay, now, He's talking about Jesus' death on the cross, which not only brings the Gentiles into relationship with God and with Israel, he's going to bring them into that because what was dividing them? What was it that was separating the Jews and the Gentiles? It was the law. It was the law that was given to Moses. And it was the law that made the, Jew, the Jews look down on their nose and say, oh, look it, you're a bunch of pagans. You're a bunch of pagans. And if you don't believe me, read Romans 1. Because Romans 1 is the way that the Jews would have viewed the Gentiles as dogs, as pagans, as completely heathen, right? Well, why were they living that way? They didn't have the law, right? Right? So instead of the Jews pointing them to the law and pointing them to Messiah, right, like they should have been doing. By the way, this enmity, this hostility wasn't God's doing. It was the Jews' failure to understand the law. And part of their purpose of the law was to point the 
pagans and the heathens to Christ. Now, stop with me for a minute there. How many of us in our holier-than-thou attitude as Christians have ever looked down upon lost people who are living very sinful life and thought to ourselves, what a bunch of heathen dogs? We've never done that, have we, as Christians? Well, if you haven't, then either, then either you're telling the truth or you're lying and won't admit it. But I'll be the first one to tell you, in my mind, I've done that in the past. I've looked down at non-Christians who didn't have the Bible, who didn't have access to God, who weren't part of church, and I looked down upon them, down my nose, and what a bunch of heathens. They deserve hell. Instead of opening up the Word of God, pointing them to the Word of God, pointing them to the one who could rescue them from their sinful behavior. And I am thank God that people didn't do that with me before I was saved. Right? And so the very thing that was supposed to help them point people to the one true God, the law and what God expected, they used the law against the, the Gentiles and beat them with it and said, shame on you. You can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. And that's what separated them. The enmity came from the way the Jews viewed the law, not what it got intended, but the way the Jews viewed the law and it allowed the hostility to build and build and build and build and build. To the point where they were so confused between their original role of being separate from the world so they weren't tainted by the world. They confused that with hostility. See, look at these, these non-Jews, these pagans, these dogs, these uncircumcision. They can't live, and so they, they just ignored them. And how, where do you see the greatest picture of that? In the Gospels. Where Jesus goes in to Levi's house, a tax collector, a tax collector, the worst of the worst. He goes in, and he probably has a lot of people around him, including Gentiles, prostitutes, sinners, all that kind of stuff. And the Pharisees look at them and say what? Why is he eating with these tax collectors and sinners? Why is he eating with these pagans? See, they were confused. Instead of looking at the, the tax collectors and sinners and pointing them to the law and pointing them to Messiah and pointing them to what God requires and demands out of people to be holy, they used the law against them to push them further away. That was the enmity that he was talking about. And what Paul is saying is, Jesus came and did away with that. He didn't come to abolish the law, but according to these verses, he came to abolish through his death, by his blood, the enmity that was being created by the law and the Jews to get rid of it so that he could make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. And he's saying, What's the big deal, pastor? Look at the church today. The church is made up of primarily whom? Gentiles. You don't see a whole lot of Jews in the church today, right? So we look and go, what's the big deal, pastor? Oh, by the way, I've got a couple Jewish Messianic friends. We get along okay. Yeah, it's only because of what God did that I get along with my Jewish Messianic friends. But if I were living in first century, I would have a struggle with the Gentiles, and by the way, those who are studying the book of Acts, chapter 15, where there are people who are coming along and say, well, these Gentiles are getting saved, but they got to go, go back under the law, back under circumcision, right? And the boys get together in Jerusalem and argue through it and decide, no, we're not going to lay that burden on them. We're going to let them come in. We have some regulations, but... So it was an issue at one point. It's not anymore, but it was. And his purpose in doing this was bringing together two hostile groups, making them into one new man. What's interesting, which means, this is interesting. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but when you become a Christian as a Jew, you lose the identity Jew. When you become a Christian as a Gentile, you lose the identity Gentile. Paul says you're made into one new man. Now, can you imagine 
taking two groups that are hostile toward each other and making them one. Now, I was going to save this for the end of the message, but I'll share it now because I think it fits really well. Listen to this illustration. If you don't think this is a big deal, if you don't think what I'm talking about is a big deal uh, to Paul, listen to this illustration. So imagine the Garnets. I'll pick on my own family. and you can, you can add your own family here. Imagine the Garnets inviting, wanting to make peace so much that they're going to invite into their home a teenager, a 15-year-old teenager who has threatened us with guns, who has attempted to burn our house down and inviting them to be part of our family and adopting them into our family. Okay, did that get your attention at all? Did you, I mean, think about that. You think there might be a little bit of arguing going on? I'm not going to invite them to my I can just see my children. They, Dad, they tried to burn our house down. Dad, they tried to kill you. Dad, and you want to make them part of our family? That's what Paul's talking about here. You can just see the Jews saying, God, are you serious? Jesus, are you serious? Paul, are you serious? The very people who hated us, we're making them, we're bringing them in from being alienated foreigners. We want them to come in and be full citizens and full family members. Are you kidding me? But listen to what Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 2. Not only did Jesus, who is our peace, do that, but it says in that his purpose was not just to make them one. Okay, that would be, that would be this kind of peace. Horizontal peace. Taking two hostile enemies and making them into one, giving, establishing horizontal peace. But then he goes on, he says, and might reconcile them both into one body. To whom? To God through the cross. By having put it to death, the enmity. Now this is interesting. Paul has actually started out with horizontal peace when he really should have started with vertical peace. Because unless we are reconciled to God first, and by the way, who needed reconciliation? Just the pagan Gentiles? No, no, no. The Jews needed reconciliation as well. So it says, not only did, did we both need reconciliation to God, but we need reconciliation to each other. And it's interesting because as I was teaching through this yesterday, I said, Make your, here's your visual aid, Nancy. Make yourself an H. Make yourself an H. Pretend there's an H here. The two vertical bars on that H are the Jews and the Gentiles. Both being reconciled to God as groups. And in doing so, Jesus brought reconciliation to the two hostile groups here. And the enmity he's talking about in this verse, by reconciling them both in one body to God through the cross, by having put to death the enmity. The enmity he's talking about there is the hostility between us and God. You think, you think about how supernatural is. What is God doing? God is not only reconciling each group to himself individually, but through that beautiful picture, he's now beginning to reconcile them to each other. Because why? Because they're part of the same family. Can you imagine? I mean, how many of us have conflict in our family? Right? Praise God. I'm going to say this. You've heard me share some things about my family in the past. I don't have the greatest relationship with my family because I'm a believer and most of them are not. But yesterday, we met together on Zoom, the four of us, the four siblings. Okay, you're talking about George. You, you would appreciate this. I'm a conservative when it comes to politics. My brother is as far left liberal as you can possibly get. My sister and I, Tina, believe in Jesus. The other ones don't. We were able to reconcile yesterday and have a beautiful conversation about our past, reminiscing about our past. Right? Will there be conflict? Yeah, because of where we stand you know, politically and religiously. But, but we had that. We had that ability. It was beautiful. And when you see reconciliation like that, it's beautiful. You're willing to put aside what's happened in the past. You're willing to say, you know what, let's focus on now. Right? And that's what God is doing here. And you continue on. It says, and he came and preached peace to you who are far away. That would be Jesus. 
came and preached peace to you who were far away, which would be those Gentiles who, who were, weren't even close to God. They had no connection to God whatsoever and to those who were near. Right? And I'll give you a couple scriptures. Romans 10, 12 through 13. You can write that down. And Romans 11, 16 through 19. Right? That's what Jesus did. He, he grafted in the Gentiles into Israel. And he made us into one new man. Look at what he finally says uh, at the end of verse 18. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Whoa. This is radical. Two groups who are hostile. Two groups, one that was close to God, one that had nothing to do with God, are now being brought into intimate relationship. And we'll see it in these next set of verses with the Trinity. Not just God, but the Spirit and Jesus as well. Be brought into intimate relationship. And I, and I will give you this, Acts 11.15. I'm just going to go there real quickly. Acts 11.15, this comes out of our, our study that we've been studying on Thursday night. Right? Listen to what listen to what said in Acts eleven fifteen. And as I began to speak, this is Peter, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, the Gentiles, just as he did at us in the beginning. The very Holy Spirit who fell on them at Pentecost, the Jews at Pentecost, is the very same, not a different Holy Spirit, the very same Holy Spirit that would fall upon the Gentiles as they were saved the very same way that the Jews were, and that was by faith in Jesus Christ alone. The Gentiles don't have a different God from the God of the Jews. They have the very same God. That's what's supernatural in all of this, right? And a couple different uh, scriptures you can go and look at as well about the Spirit. Galatians 3.14 and verse 28. And 1 Corinthians 12, 13 talks about drinking of the same spirit, Jews and Gentiles. Now, look at, this is what's cool in the end. The last point, what is true of the Gentiles because of Christ in verses 19 through 22? Now we see, not only are they reconciled into one body, but God's going to erect them and assemble them together with the Jews. This is going to be so cool. This is the church, people. This is the church. This is what we are part of now. The very thing Paul was talking about 2,000 years ago is what's going on right now. My, you know what my only, my only regret is? That we don't have more Jews, Messianic Jews in our midst. I wish God would bring what they call themselves as completed Jews. I wish God would bring some completed Jews in our midst because, boy, they would bring flavor to our Christianity. And they would give wisdom and insight into the Scripture that we Gentiles just don't get. I wish God would. So listen to what he says. So if you go back, back to Ephesians here, chapter 2, verse 19. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens. Remember, they were alienated before. They were strangers before. They had no connection to Israel. They had no part of the community, no connection to God. But now your fellow citizens, the very thing that they were not allowed to be, they've now become full-fledged citizens. So they've gone from foreigners completely alienated to now part of the family kind of like that illustration the one that was hostile to the family has now become a full-fledged member with all the rights right he says with the saints that would be god's people the jews and you're part of god's household uh first timothy 3 15 first peter 4 17 talks about the household of god the building that God is building. He says, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, that's the early church. And by the way, the, the word prophets there is not Old Testament, but New Testament prophets. Okay? The, the apostles and the prophets were ones that laid the foundation of the church. They were the ones that would establish the canon, the word of God we have today. That's what the church was built on, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Right? Jesus is the corner, what's the, what's the most important part of a building? I'm looking at you, George. You, you, you built buildings, right? I don't know much about building buildings. The most important is the cornerstone, right? 
Because what happens? Without the cornerstone, what happens to the building? Even if you have a good foundation, without the cornerstone, what happens? Crumbles, right? So the apostles and prophets are the foundation, and they are the foundation in terms of preaching the gospel, but Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the thing that's going to hold the building together, right? And uh, Isaiah 28, 16 talks about him being the cornerstone, right? It's a prophecy from the Old Testament. And look at what he goes on to say, in whom the whole building, okay, the building, the building, Jews, Gentiles, being built up together, erected as God's household, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, right, and that's Jesus, we're being fit together in Jesus, we're being fit together through our relationship to Christ and with each other, being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. Now, here, the word holy temple is not talking about an individual Christian who is now the resident temple of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about a collection of people full of the Holy Spirit who now have access to the Spirit who are being built together one stone upon another, right? And whom you are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Now, this is interesting. If you hadn't noticed it before, uh, the Trinity is in this text, okay? Listen, listen to, I want to share this with you. Um, I can find it here. Well, it's the idea that, you, that, that God is the one who is being presented. We are being presented to God. We are God's building. So we're being presented to him we're being built up in Christ, and it's happening through the Holy Spirit, right? We are being built into a dwelling of God. We're God's dwelling. We're God's building. By the way, beautiful building that we have, this is not God's dwelling. This is not God's building. Take away the building. Knock the building down. And can we still be the church? Yeah. We could gather in my backyard. We could gather out in the front lawn. This building is not what God's building. What God is building is us together into a house, right? Jew and Gentile together into a holy temple. Now let me end by pointing you to 1 Peter for a minute. This is a beautiful cross-reference to what Paul's talking about in Ephesians. 1 Peter chapter 2. Listen to what he says. Verse 4, and coming to him as a living stone which has been rejected by men but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones, it's talking about us individually, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. So we're being individually, we're the stones that are being built up into one house, right? And we're being built up for the purpose of being a holy priesthood. And a priest was one who was the mediator between God and man. So our purpose as we are growing in our walk with the Lord together, our purpose is to be a mediator between the God we know who is over this house and the people who are not in the house to try to bring them in. That's through the gospel, right? He says... Um, you also as living sons are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. Paul talked about that. And he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is, is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, which became the very cornerstone, and a stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were appointed. But you, Paul says, or Peter says, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness into his light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Now think about that. Does that relate to the Jews, that verse? Yeah. How much more does it relate to us? Those of us who are far away from God, who had no hope apart from God opening the doors up for us, right? We were kept, we were scorned, we were looked away at, 
as, as, as the Gentiles. God opened the door through Christ. And not only did he reconcile to us this way, but he reconciled us this way. That's why I love where Paul says in Galatians, in Christ, there's no Greek, there's no Jew, there's no slave, there's no free, there's no male, there's no female. And let's get real, folks. There's no black and there's no white. There's no, Jew, there's no Democrat, there's no Republican. The, that's all gone. We are part of the family of God through Christ and Christ alone. He is our peace, not only to God, but he's our, he is our peace between us. Rather than focus on our differences, body, let's focus on what we have in common. And that's our relationship with the God of the universe through Jesus Christ by the power of his spirit. And the one task that God has given us is to be holy and to go preach the gospel. I am so sick and tired of the separation. I'm so sick and tired of the conversation that does nothing but separate us. Right? Here's the one thing we have in common with unbelievers. We were sinners just like them. We can't look at them and say, well, I'm holy and you're not da 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 No, I was just like you. I was a wretched sinner. If it weren't for God's mercy and grace, I would be exactly where you are today. So let me show you. Let me show you how I got to be where I am today by the God of the universe, by his grace and mercy. Right? Let's get rid of the separation. And I'll tell you what. I'm going to quote somebody. You know who Morgan Freeman is? Morgan Freeman has a tend tendency to be a little liberal. That's just his makeup. But I heard somebody share something the other day that Morgan Freeman said, and I believe this was the mouth of God saying this. They asked him the question, Morgan, how do we get rid of all this tension in terms of this racism? He said, stop talking about it. Stop talking about the black cop who killed the white young man. Or the white, the white cop that killed the black. Let's talk about the fact that a cop killed an innocent man. Let's get, a, let's get rid of the separation. In the body of Christ in particular, let's focus on what's important, church. Let's focus on the fact that we've been reconciled to God. Right? And, and I always joke, I, I may not be George's enemy, you know, hostile, hostility-wise, but... We're in one body, George, through Jesus, and you and I, probably outside of the church, outside of Jesus, wouldn't have a whole lot in common. George is the building things with his hand. I can't build a thing with my hands, right? So think about that in the church today. God has brought together those of us who are so far separate outside of Christ. We don't have anything in common to the fact that he's brought us to a place where if nothing else we have in common... It's Jesus Christ and his purpose of the gospel, church. I, I don't know what this message did for you today. It's a hard one to preach because the enmity doesn't exist between Jew and Gentile anymore. But what's the takeaway from this? The takeaway is if it weren't for God, you and I would be far away from God today. If he hadn't extended his mercy to us as Gentiles, right? Thank God we're in one body with the Jews. Thank God that God's going to bring more of them in to the gospel. And thank God that he could use us to preach the gospel to his people to bring them in. But if nothing else you walk away with is you're only in the family because of Jesus. What are we doing? What are we doing with those who are far away from God, from those who are separate from God? What are we doing to show them that the door is wide open through Jesus Christ and Christ alone, right? Who might be our natural enemy in our mind that we need to reach out to those who are separate from God in Christ and show them that there's a way in to be part of the family through Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. I pray that I said some things today that stuck to the wall and that made sense. Lord, I know this was not an easy text to preach. 
And I just pray I explained it in a way that made sense to people. And Lord, as Gentiles, would give us a deeper appreciation of the fact that before Jesus, we were far away from God. And I dare say, if we were living in the days before Christ, and Christ hadn't come yet, most of us sitting here today probably would be going to hell and without hope. But thank you, we live in a time after Jesus came. Thank you that we were brought in as the Gentiles and grafted into the Jews and grafted in, so, in, a, in a way that we don't become arrogant like they were toward us. But rather our heart goes out to the Jews, to those who, who do not know their Messiah. Lord, may we reach out to them and show them, those who are far off, whether it be Gentiles or Jews, those who are far off, there is a way to God. There is a way to be part of the family. There is a way to find hope. And Lord, may we not just whisper it, but may we shout it. Lord, be with us as we sing this final song. May we shout to the Lord because of what he's done for us. We praise you, we thank you in Jesus' name.